Appreciate that scripture reading. I want to encourage you to keep your Bible open to the Gospel of Luke. We're going to spend our time almost entirely in the Gospel of Luke this morning. So thankful for the good singing that we've had, and Randy, the songs you've selected, I noticed that theme that you picked out, and appreciate that so very much, uh, well-worded prayers. Uh, we are going to certainly be praying for Danny's two daughters. We're, we're thankful for our number who have had been struggling with COVID and are back in our assemblies today. Uh, that's the answer to prayers, and we're encouraged by that and thankful for that. But we have others we need to be praying for regarding COVID as well, and and so we continue to pray, we continue to be careful as we serve Lord through these different times that are with us today. We know from our reading, and many of us are familiar with this account from Scripture, we know that Jesus was born in a stable. We know that he was wrapped up in strips of cloth and he was laid to sleep in a feeding trough. This wasn't because Joseph and Mary were poor. The text tells us it's because there was no room for them in the inn. And when we read about the inn here in Luke chapter 2, we can't help but think about a hotel, right? Uh, our, our country is, is dotted with hotels as people are traveling. That's a place where they can stay when they're away from their home. Maybe they're, they're in between go, going from one place to another. Uh, as I read and study commentators and scholars, they, they suggest that the inn here is not like a hotel that we would, we would think of in our time today, but rather it would be homes of people where they had an extra room. And that room would be reserved for family that would come in to visit them, or it could be used for people who were traveling through and would stop in their community. Well, as we read the text, we see that Bethlehem is full of people who have come because of the census. And so when Joseph and Mary get there, there isn't a room for them. And so they stay in, in a stable. That would be either in a cave, again, scholars tell us, that would be a, 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 something that would be carved out of the side of a hill where animals would be kept in a pen overnight, or it would be in a shed that would be adjacent to someone's home. But that's the only place where they could find shelter for that night, and it was during that night uh, that Mary gave birth and Jesus was born. Jesus being born in a place that had no room for him would become an unfortunate characteristic of his life and his ministry. The Gospel of Luke is sometimes set forth as the Gospel of Inclusion. It is, it is the, the account of Jesus coming and, and the gospel going forth and being welcoming to everyone. Of the four gospel accounts, Luke is the only one written by a Gentile. And it was written for a Greek or Gentile audience. And the gospel of Luke emphasizes the place of women in the kingdom. Uh, in that day and age, in that culture, that would be, unthink that would be unheard of. Women would be considered outsiders, but the Gospel of Luke is inclusive of outsiders. It, it, it's inclusive of women. It's inclusive of the Samaritans. The parable of the Good Samaritan is found in Luke. In Luke chapter 17, we have the ten lepers who are healed, and, and only one of them returns to thank the Lord. He is a Samaritan. But the Samaritans were viewed as outsiders, and of course the Gentiles were. Uh, but the Gentiles play uh, a, an important role in the Gospel of Luke. So here, in the Gospel of Luke, we have a Gospel that is focused on inclusion. Everyone is included, but at the same time, Luke does not overlook the times that Jesus was sent away. Luke does not uh, overlook the times where Jesus was rejected. It starts right here with this statement of there being no room for Jesus in the end. What I want to do, I want us to go through the Gospel of Luke, and I want us to consider five other times that there was no room for Jesus. And as we do, we're going to look at the circumstances involved. We're going to look at the reason why there was no room, but it's also going to give us opportunity to stop and look at ourselves. And what I want us asking as we go through this study and as we leave here today, I want us asking, do I have room for Jesus 
in my life today. We're going to look at five different accounts. We're going to take the time to read the accounts. I don't apologize for that. As, a, as an older gospel preacher was known to say, when I'm reading the Bible, you know we've got that right. So I don't apologize for that, but we're going to take a look at some rather lengthy readings today as we go through and consider those who had no room for Jesus. Let's start in our Lord's hometown of Nazareth. Turn with me to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, here Jesus is getting started with his ministry, and he comes to his hometown. He comes back to Nazareth. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has appointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said... Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, You will surely say this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then he said, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in the land in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months and there was a great famine throughout all the land but to none of them was Elijah sent except to, except to Zarephath the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow and many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian so all those in the synagogue when they heard these things were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and they led him to the brow of the hill over which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. And passing through the midst of them, he went his way. Jesus is in his hometown of Nazareth. He is doing his preaching and teaching in his ministry, and so he does the same thing for them there, but he is, he is speaking to a gathering of people who already know him. They are already familiar with him. Notice, they're, they're marveling at these gracious words coming out of his mouth, and they say, this is Joseph's son. We, we know who this is. That familiarity with him actually posed an obstacle for their faith. Because they couldn't get over the fact that they, they knew who he was, was already familiar with him, that, that the things he was saying had little impact upon their faith. He goes on to say in verse 25, no prophet is accepted in his own country. And as a general rule, that is true. It is very difficult for, for individuals uh, who have been known from their youth, that is, individuals have watched them grow up, have seen them make their mistakes in their youth, to take a position of authority over them, or to have a position in which they can instruct them and challenge them and correct their way of thinking. Very few gospel preachers are preaching full-time in the pulpits of the congregations where they grew up. And there are exceptions to that, but there are very few exceptions to that. That credibility is often given to someone that they're not entirely familiar with. Jesus says, you're going to say, you need to come back to your home and do your miracles here instead of going off and doing them somewhere else. And Jesus is telling them, you don't have the faith to accept me. I'm not going to be doing those miracles here. And they were offended by this. They were offended at Jesus. They're filled with wrath. They thrust him out of his hometown. They take him out to, to the, the hill to throw him down off of it and kill him. I want you to think about that. 
As you're reading the Gospel of Luke, this is the first time people are trying to kill Jesus, and it's his own hometown. It's his hometown people who are trying to do this to him. Of course, he escapes. He, he, he passes through their midst, the last verse we read said. But, but the point I want to make is that the people of Nazareth had no room for Jesus. He was not welcome there any longer because they were offended by him. The same thing's true today. There are people today who are offended by Jesus. I don't mean necessarily the idea of Jesus, but the Jesus we read of in Scripture is very offensive to people today. What do you mean there's only one Savior? Jesus said there's only one. In John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes through the Father but through me. That excludes every other Savior, and that's offensive to some people today. Some people are offended by our Lord's very strict standards of righteousness. You mean I can't call myself a Christian, a follower of Christ, and do whatever it is I want to do? Jesus says, no, you can't, and that's offensive to some people. Some people are offended by the idea that Jesus would be their eternal judge. I don't want anyone judging me. No one has the right to judge me. You can't judge me. Some people find Jesus offensive even today. And like those in Nazareth, they have no room for Jesus in their life. As I look at this, as we're leaving Nazareth, I can't help but wonder, is that me? Is there something about Jesus that offends me so that I would have no room for Jesus anymore in my life? I need to be careful of that. But let's let's go with Jesus now as he gets in a boat with his disciples and, and sets sail across the sea of Galilee to the, to the eastern shore to an area uh, that is called the, the Gadarenes. In Luke chapter 8, verses 26 through 37. Luke chapter 8, verse 26. Then they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when he stepped out on the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. And he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For he had often seized him, and and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demons into the wilderness." Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. And they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. Now a herd of many swine was feeding there on the mountain. So they begged him that he would permit them to enter them. And he permitted them. And the demons went out of the man and entered the swine. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. When those who fed them saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then they went out to see what had happened and came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. They also who had seen it told them by what means he who had been demon-possessed was healed. Then the whole multitude of the surrounding region of the Gadarenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. And he got into the boat and returned. Jesus did most of his work in his ministry in the northern part of Israel around the Sea of Galilee. Well, on this occasion, they get in the boat and they sail to the east, to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, to an area that's called the Gadarenes. We realized that this was an area that was populated primarily by Gentiles. The only thing that tells us that is that there were many herds of swine there, and we know Jews wouldn't have anything to do with raising swine. And so this, this, these were Gentiles. Well, there was also a man there that was well known to be severely demon-possessed. He never acted normal. He, he was naked. He lived out in the tombs. They had tried to... To, to capture him, they had tried to, to control him, even put him in chains, 
and he burst those chains. So here, here's a man, they've never seen him act like anything other than a wild animal. Jesus shows up, casts the demons out of him, they enter the swine, all the swine run immediately down into the sea and they're drowned, and immediately the owners go everywhere and tell everyone what has happened. They all gather back, they see the man clothed, sitting still in his right mind, they hear about what Jesus has done, and they're afraid. Verse 37, they're filled with that fear, and they tell Jesus, leave. Can you imagine that? As we study the life of Christ and we know He's the Son of God in the flesh, can you imagine a whole region of people demanding that Jesus leave? And that's exactly what they're doing. They have no room for Jesus because they're afraid of Him. They're afraid of Him. I want to suggest to you that there are people who are afraid of Jesus today. What do you mean afraid of Jesus today? There are people today who are afraid of having their beliefs challenged. You mentioned Jesus, you're talking about religion, and some people have their religious convictions already settled, and they never want to have those convictions challenged. But that's exactly what Jesus does. When he shows up, he challenges people's convictions, and they're afraid of that. There'd be some who are afraid of the demands and the requirements that Jesus gives in order to follow him. They don't, they don't want to hear that. They, they certainly don't want to do that. There are some who are afraid of the persecution that would come if they were to become followers of Christ because Christians suffer. But what do you mean persecution? We don't have that kind of persecution in our world today. Well, we do have persecution in our world at large today. But in our culture today, I want you to think about this. Here's how subtle this persecution is. Think about the entertainment programs that are popular today. In those programs, unless you're talking about a channel or a network or a program that's devoted to a so-called Christian audience, in these programs, a person that is portrayed on the program as being a believer, being a devout Christian, how often are they the source of the humor in that show? How often are their beliefs and their convictions the source of, of the laughs and the jokes? See, that's subtle. That's subtle, but it sends a message to the world, you don't want to be that. You don't want to be like that. And so when Jesus shows up, I don't want anything to do with this guy. I don't want anything to do with Jesus. I don't want him exposing my false beliefs, I don't want him making requirements of me, I don't want to have to suffer for him. And so there are people today who have no room for Jesus because they're afraid of Jesus. Is that me? Could that be you? Could that be me? That we're afraid of Jesus and so we would tell him we have no room for you anymore. Well, let's go on to the area of the Samaritans. In Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, let's read verses 51 through 56. Now it came to pass, when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know of what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. There's a lot in this short reading we have here. We're just going to focus on the first three verses. I want you to notice that in the Gospel of Luke, Luke progresses more quickly than the other Gospel writers do. By the time we get to chapter 9, Jesus is already through his third year of ministry, and he's ready to go to Jerusalem to be crucified. So he has in his mind, he's up in Galilee, up in the northern part. He's got to get to Jerusalem, which is in the southern part. The only thing, he's got to go through an area of Samaritans 
in order to get there. Now, John chapter 4 and verse 9, when John talks about Jesus encountering the Samaritan woman at the well, John informs us that the Samaritans had no dealings with the Jews. And the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. And so there was that animosity, that racial tension between these two groups. Jesus has already uh, been kind to Samaritans. He's already encountered Samaritans. Uh, we know from John chapter 4 that that entire city of Samaritans ends up believing in Jesus. But here on this occasion, they do not receive him. Jesus sends people ahead. They go to this village of the Samaritans to prepare for them. And the Samaritans say, absolutely not. Why? Not because they knew Jesus personally, but because he's a Jew and he's going to Jerusalem to worship. And the only thing he's wanting to do is to pass through our village, perhaps stay the night. Maybe that's what they're preparing for. We're not going to help any Jew get to Jerusalem to worship. Why did they have no room for Jesus? Because they were prejudiced against him. They were prejudiced against him. There was no room for Jesus in that village of the Samaritans. There are some people today that have no room for Jesus for the same reason. They have preconceived ideas about Christianity as a whole. You mentioned Jesus, you might as well mention Christianity. They go hand in hand, and they've already got bad ideas about Christianity, false ideas, negative ideas about, about Christianity. They don't care to learn. They, they don't care to, to look and see what, what, what's really true. They just, no, automatically have no room for Jesus. There are some who have the preconceived idea that Jesus would never save them. I've had people tell me, you don't understand the things I've done. Maybe Jesus would save other people, but Jesus would never save me. What are they doing? They, they've already decided for themselves what Jesus would do without taking the time to go to the Scriptures and see what this man is all about and see whether or not he really would save them or not. And, and let me just save you the time. Yes, he will. He will, but they've decided, they've already determined, no, he won't have anything to do with me. Or it may be somebody that has the preconceived idea that, you know, I'm all right with the Lord. Jesus and I, we're, 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 we're tight. I've had people tell me that before. And, and you can't tell them otherwise. They have, they have no interest whatsoever in sitting down and studying the Bible with me because they've already decided for themselves who Jesus is and whether or not they're already right with him. They've got no room for Jesus at least not the real Jesus, this, this Jesus that we read of in the Scriptures, when He shows up, they've got no room for Him. Why? Because they've already decided what they're going to believe about Jesus. As I walk away from that village with the Lord and walk to another one, I can't help but wonder, could that be me at times? Have I already decided what Jesus is and who Jesus is and what Jesus would require of me before I go and open up Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and find out the truth? We need to be careful. Those who are prejudiced against Jesus have no room for Jesus. Now I want us to consider an individual. Turn to Luke chapter 18. We've looked at cities. We've looked at areas. Now let's look at an individual, someone that some of us are familiar with, the rich young ruler. He's mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and in Luke. Let's read Luke's account. Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through 23. Now a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother. And he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. 
But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. To begin with, in this account, I believe this young man is sincere. Now, Jesus is approached by different individuals insincerely. And they're asking him questions to test him, try, try, to try to trip him up. That's not the case here. There's nothing in Matthew, Mark, or Luke that indicates he's anything other than sincere. He wants to know how to inherit life. But Jesus says, what's written? What are the commandments? And, and he answers correctly. But knowing his heart, Jesus knows that this man has an obstacle in his heart and his life that is preventing him from inheriting life. He has a great love for his possessions. So Jesus says, if you want life, you're going to have to get rid of those things, and you're going to have to follow me. Well, that was unacceptable to this man. Matthew's account. Now we read here in verse 23 in Luke, when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. Matthew's account in Matthew 19 verse 22 says, he went away sorrowful. So instead of sending Jesus away, I've got no room for you, he left Jesus. I have no room for you. Turned and walked away from him. He was sincerely interested. He was that close to having life. But when he found out what Jesus would require of him, he had no room for Jesus. And of course, you know where I'm going with this. There are people today who have no room for Jesus in their heart because they've already filled it with something else. Maybe like this man, their heart is full of a love of money. And that's what drives them in their life. And they may have some outside interest, but what truly drives them in their heart is their love for money. And I want to tell you, you don't have to have money to have a love for money. But that's a driving force in many people's lives today. Maybe it's a love for self. And it's all about, it's all about themselves. And they might be interested in, in Christ for selfish reasons. It's going to make me look better. Among, you know, if, if I've just moved to this country, I need to become a Christian to fit in. Or, or if, if I'm going to be successful in business, I, I need to be a member of this church over here. And again, they're, they're driven by, by something other than a sincere interest. Maybe it's popularity. Maybe it's pleasure. Whatever it is, Jesus will take second place to nothing. Whatever it is that's in our heart that's keeping us from having complete and total room for Christ, we need to get rid of. And for some people, that's a price that's too, too high to pay. And such individuals will say, like the rich young ruler, I've got no room for Jesus. And of course, I can't help but think of myself when I read a passage like this. Could that ever be me? Could there ever be anything that the Lord would require of me in which I would turn and walk away from Him? How about you? What is your price? What is your breaking point? You better be very careful answering that question because as soon as you do, Satan will put it in front of you. But what is it that would cause you to, to decide, I've got no more room for Jesus? and walk away from him. It can happen. And then finally, let's go to Luke chapter 23. And on that Friday morning, let's join the chief priest and the elders of the people as they have bound Jesus and brought him before Pilate to have him crucified. We know that, that the Jewish leaders became the enemies of Jesus very quickly. And that final week, their their Rage against Jesus grew to the point that they determined that they had to get rid of him. Judas fell right into their laps when he came and said, what will you give me if I betray him to you? They gave him 30 pieces of silver, and that sealed the deal. And so that night, when Jesus was sent away from the upper room, he went and got that mob and went out to the Garden of Gethsemane. There, Jesus was arrested. 
He was tried at night before the Sanhedrin, which was in violation to the law of Moses. And they, they determined that he was guilty of blasphemy and he deserved to die. Well, they met again that morning when the sun came up to give some legitimacy to their charge and to their, their authority, and they brought Jesus to Pilate because, of course, the Romans would not allow them to exercise capital punishment. If somebody was to be put to death, the Romans had to, to decide that. So they had one more obstacle. They had to get Pilate on board with this, and then they could finally be rid of Jesus. But Pilate was proving that to be uncooperative in this effort. Now let's turn to Luke chapter 23, and let's read verses 13 through 25. Then Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, said to them, You have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people, and indeed, having examined him in your presence, I found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accuse him. No, neither did Herod, for I sent you back to him, and indeed nothing deserving of death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him, for it was necessary for him to release one to them at the feast. And they all cried out at once, saying, Away with this man, and release to us Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion made in the city, and for murder. Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus, again called out to them, but they shouted, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Then he said to them the third time, Why? What evil has he done? I have found no reason for death in him. I will therefore ch chastise him and let him go. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified, and the voices of these men and of the chief priests prevailed. So Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested, and he released to them the one they requested, who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison, but he delivered Jesus to their will. Pilate, to his credit, Pilate tries three times to reason with these Jews. He hasn't done anything worthy of death. I'll punish him. I'll whip him. I'll chastise him and let him go. That should appease you. No. Crucify him. Now the other gospel accounts tell us that at the feast, at the Passover feast, it was the custom of Pilate as a goodwill gesture to the Jews to release one of their prisoners. Because although Rome had authority over them, they, they, they wanted it to be conducted in a, as peaceful a way as possible. So for a goodwill gesture, I'll release someone to you. Let me release Jesus to you. Let, let him be the one that I release unto you. And they said, no. Release Barabbas unto us. And Luke tells us that he was guilty of several things, including murder. Could you imagine telling him, no, we'll, we'll take the murderer, Release him back to us out into the general population, but put this man Jesus to death. That's exactly what they were doing. And what fascinates me about this early morning scene before Pilate is that Sunday of that very week, Jesus entered into the city riding on the colt of a donkey with all of Israel, all of Jerusalem saying, Hosanna, son of David. He was celebrated. As the Messiah, five days later, crucify him. Why? Kill him. Crucify him. They didn't have room for Jesus anymore. What, what led them to this? What, what caused them to demand that Jesus be crucified and Barabbas be released? It's Matthew's account. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 20 says, but the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Why were all of the Jews who were there on that morning all with one voice saying, crucify him? Because they'd been misled. Because when Pilate took Jesus into the inner court to, to judge him, or when Pilate had sent him to Herod, 
That's when the chief priest and the rulers got busy talking to all the people. We found him guilty of blasphemy. We want him crucified. Ask for Barabbas. They had been misled. And so they had no room for Jesus. Today, people are misled about Jesus. So they have no room for him. They're misled by unbelievers by those who don't even believe that Jesus was the Son of God, may not even believe that Jesus is actually a real historical figure. Have you ever watched all these, any of these programs on cable show networks like the History Channel about the life of Jesus? I ran across one of those the past few days. It usually happens around this time of the year or around Easter. We've got these people that are going to tell us about Jesus and I hardly ever take the time to watch those shows because when I do, I can just mark off the number of things they get wrong. And you know, if they can't get the life of Jesus right, how do I know they're telling me the truth about Abraham Lincoln or World War II, which, yeah, for me, was a historical event. And then there'll be some people say, yeah, well, 9-11 was for me. That's, that's just the way time has a way of going on. We're going to let unbelievers mislead us about Jesus. What about false teachers? What about false teachers? It, it, it's concerning to me how many of my brethren will, without any reservation at all, listen to denominational preaching. Listen to podcasts and watch webcasts done by denominational people. We'll read books written by false teachers. And we'll, we'll listen to them and read them without exercising any kind of discernment. And pretty soon those false ideas creep into their heart and creep out of their mouth with ideas and sayings or, or post on social media. And I scratch my head and I wonder, where did my brethren get these ideas? They're being misled. They're being misled to the point that when the real Jesus shows up, they've got no room for that. They've got no room for that. They've already decided what Jesus is all about. Could that be me? Yes, it could be. I have to be very careful. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. I have to be very careful of the things that I read and the things that I hear and go back and make sure that it is right with what the Word of God has to say. Isn't that what made the people in Berea more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica? They searched the Scriptures to make sure that what they were hearing was the truth. Acts 17 and verse 11. We need to be doing the same thing. These were the people in the Gospel of Luke who had no room for Jesus. You know what? The same problem exists today. There are people today who have no room for Jesus. Different reasons. Maybe they're offended by Him. Maybe they're afraid to, con to, to come into contact with Him, to be challenged by Him. Maybe they're prejudiced against Him. Maybe they have a love for something else. Maybe they've been misled. If that's you, I would encourage you to, to come to the Gospel of Luke and to learn about the real Jesus. If you're a Christian, if you're a believer, if you're a follower of Christ, make sure that you never fall into any of these traps. So one more thing I want to say about having no room for Jesus. The people in Bethlehem had no room for Jesus when He was born. The people in Nazareth had no room for Jesus. They tried to kill Him. The people of the Gadarenes, get out of our area. They had no room for Jesus. The Samaritan, no room for Jesus. The rich young ruler, no room for Jesus. The nation of Israel as a whole, represented by those people before Pilate, crucify him. We've got no more room for this man. You know what? They found room for Jesus. Just enough room to hang him on a cross between two thieves. That's the room they had for him. And that's where he went to die for you 
and for me. You'd better have room for Jesus. You'd better open your whole heart to Jesus because he gave himself entirely for you. If you need to become a Christian, do so by obeying the gospel. What, what Jesus has said to do, repent of your sins, confess your faith, and be baptized to have those sins washed away. If you've done that, but you've become unfaithful, you've told Jesus, maybe not in so many words, but you realize you've told Jesus, I have no room for you, repent of that. And open your heart, and let the Lord back into your heart and your life. If we can help you with that in a public way, the invitation is for you, and we invite you to come as we stand and sing this song. <laughs>